Okay, let's start with this one because there are some others coming. Where um, no addressee of the um, question is, is listed, uh, it'll, it'll be a jump ball for both of you. What interrogation methods, we'll start with Mr. Stimson, what interrogation methods should the CIA and other intelligence agencies use now that the CIA memos have been released by the Obama administration? Well, they are uh, required under the executive order to follow only those 19 techniques that, uh, that uh, currently exist in the Army Field Manual. Um, I can tell you as a former local, state, and federal prosecutor, though, that when we were in the room debating those 19 techniques with a small group of us, I had a whole list of other techniques that police officers use in interrogation booths here in the United States that are perfectly lawful, like line, that should be included as a technique. Uh, we didn't include it. The Army was uncomfortable with it. Um, uh, can you imagine the CIA not being able to lie? Um, not why we pay them? Um, so uh, I think, I, in, in all seriousness, uh, they should have additional techniques that are lawful, but we shouldn't know what they are. We shouldn't tip the enemy off. I was a criminal defense lawyer for about 15 years um, before I got into the human rights realm. And once again, I hate to disappoint you, Senator. I, I agree that there are other techniques that, um, that the CIA should be able to use, like um, lying to a, 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 a detainee um, in order to get information. However, um, where I disagree um, with, with Kali, I think, is that even within the Army Field Manual, there are techniques permitted that amount to at, at least cruel and human and degrading treatment, which is prohibited by the Geneva Convention. For example? For example, sleep deprivation and isolation. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, again, having talked to experienced interrogators, um, I have learned, we have learned, and I don't know if, if any folks here, I'm, I'm sure none of you have been waterboarded, but I'm sure you've suffered some degree of sleep deprivation. Um, the, the Nazis were pros at sleep deprivation as an interrogation technique. Sleep deprivation will kill you taken to its, its natural extremes. And that is one, uh, one technique that I th think should be absolutely prohibited even though it, it is still within the Army Field Manual. Um, another is, uh, as, as I mentioned, um, prolonged isolation. It will make a person crazy. Um, this is not good for interrogation purposes as well as for humanity purposes. I was waterboarded by the press one time, but that was a long time. <laughs> so was I. <laughs> not like I was. Right. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, this I is for both pain. of you. I'm not going to touch that. It's, you're all too young to remember. We can arrange so. it for you, Kabul. I, I remember. Uh, t for both of you, what do you think um, about calls for a U.S. Truth Commission? Lay it out all on the table. Yeah, um, it's interesting. Um, when I was in office, uh, Senator Levin was gearing up for a whole series of hearings uh, hired staff, was always sending requests for information from my office. No doubt he was doing that from the CIA, from the DOD General Counsel, from the Department of Justice. Um, I, I'm not sure that there is a, a need for a truth commission since the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence is conducting, I think, a very pinpoint, laser-focused uh, inquiry. Uh, and I think that that committee has the ability to expand its charter to get what it needs behind closed doors. Look, some things are classified for a reason. Um, other things are overclassified and we shouldn't be classifying things. You know, we've gotten to this business of overclassifying too much stuff. Um, I don't see the need for it, uh, but that's more of a political judgment than a legal judgment. I, I disagree with that profoundly. Um, we live in a democracy. The ultimate authority and the ultimate responsibility for what our government does is with the citizenry. 
And if the citizenry are not informed, if the citizenry are not trusted with the information that is necessary to determine what is being done in their name, potentially crimes, then we have lost the essence of our democracy. For these reasons, I think it's absolutely essential that a process takes place on which public light can shine in order to determine what was done, why it was done, who ordered it to be done, and what the consequences were. Um, Mr. Stimson, I should know the answer to this, and I don't. I was um, a veteran, again, much too long ago for any of you to remember, but of a committee in the Congress called the Church Committee that was the first mm -hmm. congressional investigation of the intelligence community, principally the CIA. And um, I don't know why the CIA, and I'm a supporter of the CIAs but, and a defender, but I don't know why they're doing the torture. That's not their job. I mean, it, it, if there are gonna be torturers in our government, why not the Defense Department or the FBI? The CIA's intelligence gathering and analysis. Who put these guys in charge of torture? I don't know. Um, I can tell you that Secretary Rumsfeld did not want the detainee mission at all. He did not want to be the jailer. He thought the Department of Justice uh, should be the jailer, uh, but it devolved to him. Um, and I don't know, uh, and this I think serves Gabor's uh, last uh, response probably quite well. I don't know how the CIA program got started. I don't know who made the call and said, okay, you guys are gonna do it. I will note that David Addington, the chief of staff and top lawyer for Vice President Cheney, was a CIA top lawyer uh, in years past. Maybe that had something to do with it, I don't know. It's, uh, it's not the agency's job. Uh, Professor Rona, what um, are your thoughts about the Senate's failure to finance the closure of Guantanamo? Um, I know what mine are, but what, what are yours? <laughs> well, I, I don't think we've seen the last word on, on this no. issue by any means. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a real tragic abdication of duty of Congress um, to allow the president to do what he needs to do in order to affect the closure of the detention facility at, at Guantanamo. The idea that um, we cannot uh, close Guantanamo because we don't want terrorists running around released into our, our cities um, is, is frankly absurd. There are over 120 cases in our federal courts of prosecuting international terrorism, both before and since 9-11. And our, our federal courts have dealt exquisitely with the challenges of prosecuting international terrorism cases. The idea that if we shift Guantanamo detainees, even those who we want to put on trial, onto the shores of the United States and possibly into um, the operation of our normal federal criminal justice system that we will then have terrorists running around on, on our streets, I frankly find absurd. And the, the importance of closing Guantanamo as a detention facility is so great, the need to resolve this problem of individuals having been, de been detained, some now for more than seven years without having been charged with a crime, um, many of whom courts have found to have been erroneously detained. Um, this has got to stop not only for the sake of the United States coming back to the values that are, that are important to it, but also for reestablishing the ability of the U.S. to rely on its allies for cooperation in counterterrorism, to rely on the appreciation of the rest of the world for the United States' willingness and ability to uphold fundamental human rights. These are such important interests, such important values, and the counter-argument 
of the idea of, some, of somehow terrorists roaming around on the streets if Guantanamo is closed, I, I find is just irresponsible. Is it possible for the United States in the 21st century to take the position, position that there are people, one, who cannot be put on trial, and two, who can never be released, and therefore, without any kind of legal process, are going to be in jail for the rest of their lives? I hope not. I well, hope it, it's not possible. It is being said that that's the dilemma we're in. Yeah, how, it, many, how many of those people, I don't know. Yeah, the Obama administration in their court filings and their public statements and their nominees to uh, head the Department of Justice, the CIA, and even Secretary Clinton uh, have all maintained that you can uh, hold some number of Guantanamo detainees and others uh, without charging them. Uh, I don't think anyone pressed them when, during their confirmation hearings or even during press conferences. Does that mean forever? Um, uh, but it is, it is um, not true to say that um, you can't do it without some sort of procedural legal protections because that must happen. And as you all know, uh, last summer uh, the Supreme Court issued their uh, opinion in the Boumediene case which said that detainees at Guantanamo enjoy the constitutional right of habeas to challenge their detention in federal district court. That's right and that's good and I think that was predictable. Um, now the question is whether some small number of detainees in Bagram in Afghanistan can petition to challenge their detention in federal district court. But I think that um, uh, the Obama administration is um, uh, taking its time. It needs to take its time. These are complicated issues. Um, I think that I know that the Geneva Conventions envisions um, a, a periodic review uh, for basis of detention. I think the Obama administration is clearly going to enshrine that in any detention policy going forward, whether it's every six months, every year, with a federal judge, et cetera. Um, we, that remains to be seen. Uh, but no due process, no process, indefinitely detained in a, in a vacuum, uh, hopefully will never happen again. In case you haven't noticed, we're, um, the three of us are united by one fact, and that is we're all lawyers and, and suffer under that burden. I have to say, without being asked, I think in my lifetime, the worst action taken by the United States Senate was the passage of, I don't know how it's designated, the Second, Ter the Second Patriot Act or whatever it was, which gave the President of the United States virtual unlimited uh, ability to suspend ha habeas corpus. Uh, for those of you who are non-lawyers or haven't studied legal history, there is no single proposition more central to what we call the rule of law than the writ of habeas corpus, meaning the king cannot put you in jail without telling you why. Now, if, if there's something more fundamental in law, and that, of course, comes from the Magna Carta, it's what began the whole process of, of the legal democracy that long ago. And the Senate of the United States surrendered that central right to the president at his whim. I don't care, Democrat, Republican, George Bush, Barack Obama, or anywhere else. It was despicable. I won't go into who voted for and against it, but I'd like to, and if you want to meet me over there, I'll tell you <laughs> who in this state voted for it. Okay. That That's, narrows the list, obviously. <laughs> um, this is also a question I guess I've got to answer, we can all answer. Given the breakdown of the power, I mean my formulation, the breakdown of the power of the nation state and its monopoly on violence, uh, and the rise of the strength of, ooh, of Corporations, corporations and private interests within battlegrounds and wars hmm. is all violence terrorism. Well, the question doesn't quite lead to the, I mean, the formulation doesn't, I mean, that, this is an interesting question, folks. I'll let our panelists discuss the, the privatization of warfare, which I didn't mention, but it's a very interesting, the use of, of uh, contractors. contractors to, in some cases, carry out the torture. Uh, of course, all violence isn't terrorism. And as somebody has pointed, many people pointed out over the last eight years, to declare a war on terrorism, which is a method, 
would be the World War II equivalent of declaring war on Blitzkrieg. I mean, you don't, terrorism is a method used by various organizations to achieve an objective. You don't declare war on the method, declare war on the people carrying that out. I mentioned drug cartels in Mexico. Uh, I suppose they're terrorists. They certainly use terrorist tactics. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that those cartels are any terrorist watch list here in the United States. Um, certainly uh, Al-Qaeda operating in Pakistan is, I think we'd all agree as terrorists, but are the Russian mafias terrorists? In some cases, yes, in some cases, no. If they get hold of a nuclear weapon, they sure are terrorists in my book, but not all violence is terrorism. Uh, that's part of the vagueness of declaring war on terrorism. And, and I think one of the things that, even though there is no internationally accepted definition of terrorism that most everybody agrees on, is that the concept of terrorism should be limited to attacks on civilians and not the kind of um, use of force that you spoke of earlier used to be subject to the state's monopoly, namely armed forces fighting against each other. Those are in fact privileged forms of violence under international law. Right. And, and I think you would agree, if I could jump in, Senator, sure. um, that for instance, somebody like Timothy McVeigh, he attacked innocent civilians and children uh, bombing the Murrah building. Uh, it's a terrorist tactic, but he shouldn't be held without charge. Right. I mean, so it is a question of scale, isn't it? I mean, yeah. clearly that's what you're pointing to. If, if, if so-and-so gets a nuclear weapon, it's much different than Billy Bob going down the street with a stick of dynamite. Um, what about the contractors? I mean, um, I'm, I'm not comfortable with Blackwater or anybody else uh, be, being given those privileges that the uniformed military has. Can, are there things, are there duties under the Constitution that cannot be contracted out and should not be? I think there are. Um, I think contractors need to be in a supporting element uh, logistics, um, security services, that sort of things. That doesn't mean that they are defenseless. Uh, and I mean, this is a you know, three hour discussion we could have, but um, I think in terms of using them as an arm of the state in offensive operations, it offends my un understanding of what the military is for in the first place. And I think the military is the primary uh, vehicle through which we should project forward power and especially kinetic power. And, and armed forces are subject to a very tightly controlled chain of command and, and they have um, responsibility and accountability in ways that protect not only the military mission yeah. but the whole objects of foreign policy that involves the use of force. With contractors, you don't have that, that same systemic method of accountability. And so for contractors um, to be relegated the use of force that is traditionally the province of government um, is, is very dangerous, dangerous for the entire military mission and, and for foreign policy. And, and there's no better example than the MEJA, the Military Extraterritorial Jurisdiction Act. It, was, it came into being because of concerns that some contractors were not subject to the laws uh, of the United States especially, but even the domestic laws. And so, uh, you know, this, this jurisdictional nexus, this hook, just sort of arose uh, late in 2005, I think, 2004 yeah. or five. To your knowledge, have JAGs or Judge Advocate Generals of the various services who have been put in, who have been assigned or accepted assignment to defend detainees been penalized in their careers? You know, it's a good question. Uh, some of whom are my former students from the, from, the, uh, from the Navy Justice School. And Charlie Swift, who Gabor and I know quite well, uh, was a, a close and personal friend of mine when I was recalled to active duty after 9-11. I served as a senior defense counsel with Charlie. I, I think um, um, the perception is they have been penalized. Um, I hope that's not true. I'll give you uh, my answer with respect to Charlie. When I met Charlie in early 2002, he was a lieutenant commander, which is like a major in the Army. Uh, he'd already been passed over for, for, um, for promotion to commander. Um, he was planning on getting out. He'd served in the Naval Academy. We had a great time together. He's a good defense lawyer. We, had a, we defended several cases together. Uh, and then commissions came up after I left. And then 
he raised his hand willingly and did a damn good job in that case. Obviously, he took the case the whole way to the Supreme Court, and now Hamdan's a free man in his home country. Um, the the, the storyline was that Charlie was punished uh, because he took the case to the Supreme Court and he challenged the Defense Secretary of the United States government. The reality is Charlie had already been passed over. But I think there is a perception, and maybe it's true, that some have been um, penalized. I hope that's not true. These are my colleagues. Uh, I'm a military judge now. I've left the Justice School. Uh, I, I would be very disappointed and, and editorialize against that if that happened. I think that would be very wrong. Um, here's, a, here's a one that I will handle. What empirical evidence exists to support the assertion, mine, that detainee abuse encourages recruitment of terrorists? Lots. Um, <laughs> was General Petraeus. He has said that numerous times. Yeah, there you go. It's even better. <laughs> was, Guantanamo, was Guantanamo established, I think, as a detainee center, merely to avoid US, the US Constitution and international law? Partially. Um, you have to understand that when the Bush administration and our country found themselves under attack in 2001, the law of the land, the Supreme Court precedent that was standing there all by itself was Johnson's vers Johnson versus Eisentrager which um, essentially were, was a, a 1950s case where uh, post-World War II German prisoners were tried in, uh, in Germany and uh, they petition, petitioned uh, for relief in the federal courts and the, the Supreme Court said, no, you're a person with no ties to the United States, uh, you didn't commit your acts in the United States, you're not a US citizen and therefore you have no access to the courts. And so the Bush administration relied on that and I think that's probably why the Senate uh, jumped up and down and said, hey, Gitmo, you know, uh, no habeas, great. Um, but you have to understand that... The well, they, by the way, the, the Senate vote was not just no habeas at Guantanamo. It was, Mr. President, you can suspend habeas corpus for anybody you want to for as long as you want to, full stop. The, the base of, of Guantanamo, U.S. Naval Station Gitmo, was founded in 1903. It has had a lot of mission sets over the years, and it will have more mission sets after the detention mission is leaves. Uh, but it was, among the various choices, the closest choice to mainland the United States. Uh, it also was the indefinite detention facility that President Clinton used in the 90s uh, for the Haitian and other refugees who were flooding uh, the Caribbean to get the heck out of their countries. And so those detainees had challenged their detention in federal court and they got the, they got the, they got the Heisman. Nope, no, 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 no uh, joy here. Um, look, I, I think, and I know that the Obama administration is benefiting from the various mistakes the Bush administration made. One of the primary mistakes the Bush administration made early on is not going to Congress and consulting with them uh, early on to say, hey, by the way, the generals in Afghanistan who are in charge of operations want these guys out of here. This is a new type of war where intelligence is critical. We're thinking about these five places to detain them. Can we get some buy-in from you guys? Can we talk about it and then get some uh, congressional authorization for that? And I guarantee you, President Bush, Mush, or Dush, in 2001, in October, would have gotten congressional authorization for the establishment of a detention place, uh, wherever it is, uh, and it would have had the seal of congressional approval, and there would have been more buy-in uh, by the country, and the president should have come out uh, and very gracefully and eloquently, to the best he could, I've spoken about uh, why we did it in the first place with some congressional leaders right beside him. But we didn't do it, it was a mistake, and we've paid the price for it. Besides which, if they broke out, it was Castro's problem. <laughs> and there's Let, a lot of sharks in Guantanamo Bay. There really are. He, he, here's a, I, I disagree with, um, with the idea that um, Guantanamo was chosen because it was, it was close. Um, and I think, Cully, you said earlier, because Senator, you asked this question earlier about you know, why was Guantanamo chosen? Was there some nefarious reason? Um, there was definitely a nefarious reason. Um, there is documentation of the purpose behind choosing Guantanamo was um, to find a place that was indeed a legal black hole. 
to find a place that, in the view of the administration, would be beyond the purview of judicial review. They turned out to be wrong on that one, thankfully. But, the, but it was not only the question of what was the purpose of Guantanamo, there's also the question of what was the purpose of the entire structure that the Bush administration created, um, particularly in a memorandum of the president of February 7, 2002, that excluded all of its detainees from the operation of the Geneva Conventions. So it was not only the establishment of Guantanamo the place, it was the establishment of a whole extrajudicial and extra-legal framework of detention by which the United States and the administration tried to create a situation in which detainees could be made subject to abuse, could be held indefinitely, um, could be simply thrown away and not see the light of day of any either judicial review, um, public, uh, public review, or for that matter, even visits from the International Committee of the Red Cross, which is an essential ap ap aspect of the application of the laws of war. Thank you. Two final quick questions, uh, and I think you can answer this very quickly. How relevant is the Geneva Convention or the Geneva Conventions? If we and only a few other countries are following them, most aren't. I, I disagree with the premise. Um, entirely. First of all, the Geneva Conventions are the most widely um, ratified international treaties in the world. All of the problems that we've been talking about today, by the way, are not about countries violating the Geneva Conventions. It comes back to the point that you started us on, Senator, about the loss of the monopoly on the use of force. We're talking about rebel groups. We're talking about terrorist organizations. We're not talking so much about state practice and, and policy. The United States, during the years of the Bush administration, took an unfortunate detour. But by and large, the countries of the world not only are parties to, all are parties to the Geneva Conventions. They train to the Geneva Conventions. Their military are versed in the Geneva Conventions. And there is, by and large, respect for the provisions of the Geneva Conventions. Uh, here's a generic question we'll end on. Had to happen. Should Dick Cheney be indicted by the <laughs> International Criminal Court? No. We cannot criminalize policy differences uh, in this or any administration. Uh, if anyone has committed a crime, uh, that should be dealt with domestically. We can't outsource our criminal justice model. Well, there's a technical answer, which is that he can't be because the United States is not a party to the International Criminal Court. Should. Okay. Should. And, and even if the United States became a party today, then the court would not have retroactive jurisdiction. However, I think anybody who promulgated and was responsible for the creation of interrogation techniques that violate international law, violate our obligations under the Geneva Conventions, violate our obligations on, under the International Convention Against Torture, should be prosecuted. Sixty-second final statement. This uh, type of meeting should happen all over the United States. Our national security is something that we all should be concerned about. Intelligent discussion, even uh, with colleagues who we may differ on, with, on, certainly on the margins, should continue. Um, this new administration has the opportunity, I think, to uh, reset our counterterrorism and national security strategy with respect to this enemy who wants to see us all dead. And it should include military detention, properly calibrated with proper legal protections. It should include other common sense aspects that the Bush administration used and reject those that didn't work empirically. But I would urge all of you not to get all of your news from one news source. Stretch your boundaries. Read what you consider to be the opponent's positions, especially the thoughtful ones. Um, too much of this has been politicized for too long. 
Um, too many people are working hard behind the scenes to keep us safe. They're disgusted by the acidic nature of the political discourse. Um, we need intelligent discourse. We need intelligent counterterrorism policies. Uh, and that, I think, will help us cleave to, continue to adhere to the rule of law, and help us uh, humbly but forthrightly uh, remain the best country in the world. Professor Rona. <laughs> Um, I, I'm really glad to, to hear you say that, Cully, because I, too, have been extremely dispirited by the quality of some of the discourse. Um, it just does not touch upon the important issues in the way that I think the American public deserves to be and, and needs to be in, in, informed. I think the essence of how we go forward in constructing sound counterterrorism policy stems from the admonition that if um, those who do remember history are still forever condemned to repeat the, the, the lessons of it is true, it was Ben Franklin who allegedly said, those who would sacrifice liberty for a little bit of security deserve neither. And I would paraphrase that those who would sacrifice liberty for a little bit of security will get neither. I think the important point for us going forward in considering any, each and every question about counterterrorism and, and, and counterterrorism policy is to absorb the fact that civil liberties and security are not diametrically opposed. They are complementary. The way that we will find ourselves best protected includes adhering to the values, the laws, the rules that created the, the nation that the United States is today, its democratic values, its concept of fair treatment, and, and its essential adherence to the idea of the golden rule. We should not do unto others that which we would not want done to our own soldiers. If we keep those precepts in mind, then I think we will be able to shift gears into a much more effective counterterrorism policy than what we'd seen in the past eight years. The greatest protection of the freedom and security of the American people is our Constitution, and the greatest appeal we have to the people of the world are the principles contained in that Constitution. To the degree we live up to those constitutional beliefs and principles, uh, we will be a great nation. To the degree we abandon them, we will lose both our freedom and our security. Thanks to Larry Meisel and the Meisel family, those who are running the cell, most of all to all of you for being here. <laughs>